So, good morning, everybody. Um, what an inspiring story. I have to say that was, Tom, I know he's backstage right now, so I can't say it to him directly, but that was a really, really inspiring story, and I have nothing like that to tell you. I think it's incredibly humbling. You know, to, we're obviously technical people. We love doing smart things with technology, but ultimately, we're people, and, and the tools we build work for people. And whilst that is something we try to do as much as well, it's amazing to see how you know, changes to people's lives can create great technology, amazing ecosystems, uh, and ultimately, you know, happier users, happier people at the end of the day. Let's do a little bit of arm exercising here before I uh, get into the talk. So who, uh, who here either is involved in a DevOps project or is, works for a team that's called a DevOps team or has a title that involves DevOps in some way or another? I can just about see, ah, oh, there's a lot of people. So, and who here has heard uh, or read at least three or more different definitions of what DevOps could be? <laughs> so, I think that means we have an identity crisis. Uh, not a crisis that we don't know who we are and that there's far too many possible things that we could be uh, if we talk about DevOps. You know, roughly the same amount of people who said, I am involved in DevOps said, we don't really seem to have a clear definition of what DevOps is. That's, um, that's not necessarily, that's sort of multiple personality disorder maybe. We can diagnose DevOps with a, a little bit of MPD here. And so what I would like to do here is I would like to talk about, you know, having been quote unquote with the story for a very long time, um, give a short primer as to how I see the, the, the framework for, if you like, the symptoms of DevOps, what people are trying to do, what technologies they're trying to use. I would like to try to go back a little bit to talk about where that is coming from. And the reason I'm doing that is because I hope that will help people get a feeling that they're not just copying blindly something they read in a blog post somewhere or something they read about some cool company did this thing. You know, that people feel confident, that we all can feel confident that we're making the right decisions based on the right underlying reasons and that they're the right ones for us. I only have 20 minutes, so this is a story that occup could occupy an entire track. And so I'm going to give you a bit of a heads up. This is essentially part one of a much longer two-part discussion. Part two is a breakout session that happens afterwards in Venezia, I think, is the room. So if you're interested in this kind of material, um, I'll obviously talk again at the end about what we'll be talking about. But then I heartily invite you um, to come along and, and listen to that as well. So yeah, the agenda for what I'm going to try and cram into the remaining 18 minutes here today are these four points. A quick DevOps primer, um, some brief observations on what I think is the, the underlying change that we've all lived through in the past decade or so. Um, and then multiple different patterns of DevOps that I've seen in practice, and that actually tend to work quite well in practice. And then we get to the inevitable question, you know, which is the right one? So let's start out. Um, most of you will have read the, so yeah, I, I was looking for a story that or a picture that demonstrated the use of a lot of post-it notes. And clearly this is a much more fun picture than um, showing you a big scrum board. But anyway, there's plenty of cool things you can do with post-it notes. And it's nicely in salt color scheme as well, so I think we're all good there. Um, most of you will have read the, the original story about how, you know, uh, at the first unconference where this idea was thrown out, Patrick Dubois put a post-it note up on the unconference board and that said, let's talk about agile operations. Um, and what that means fundamentally to me, if there's one thing to take out of that, is that DevOps is fundamentally a methodology at heart. Agile is a methodology, agile operations, applying that methodology to ops. Most of what we do today, if you ask organizations, so what's your DevOps team involved with, or what does your DevOps initiative look like, or you know, all these titles that are popping up everywhere, or, or the tools. Uh, I heard a nice joke recently that you know, uh, whenever a piece of IT tooling seems to be created, it's a, if you make a screwdriver to open a rack, it's now a DevOps screwdriver. You know, that's the kind of rate of craziness that we have today. A lot of the emphasis and hey, we're at SaltConf, we're talking about a great and interesting piece of technology, which we use ourselves, and I have to say, our development team, they tend not to beat about the bush, they're really enthusiastic about it, so kudos to everybody, all of you who've committed to it and have made it what it is. Um, a lot of the emphasis of what we do is on tooling. You know, we talk about infrastructure as code, 
We talk about configuration management tools. We talk about environment provisioning. We talk about monitoring, about all these kinds of things. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's what we're doing. So to some extent, that is the reality of DevOps nowadays. But that is most emphatically not a methodology. That is tooling. Now I have to figure out how this clicker works. I hit forward. And one of the common reactions to this observation that there are all these DevOps teams and DevOps engineer titles and all these things is that there have been, for years now, uh, a couple of very well-worded and very wittily described rants, more or less, along the lines of, don't do what I'm doing. Think the way I'm thinking. And I have to say, I've been guilty of these kind of rants a little bit myself at times, um, where you, know, you see somebody effectively cloning what you gave as an example, as if that were the only way to do it, without seemingly understanding what the underlying motivation, the underlying driver is. Um, and to be fair, this is a, a topic that, or a theme that has gone through from the first DevOps days all the way through to the present day, where people hold up their hands at an enterprise and they go, oh God, why are they using this tool for this purpose? Or why are they having a meeting in this particular way? They're just blindly copying something else. And it feels nice and righteous, and you, know, you feel like you understand the, the, the real depth of the problem if you can say these kind of things. Oh, look at them. They don't get it. I'm the smart one. All of us together in our little smart, cuddly corner. Frankly, the reality is that it's not as though enterprises don't know this. Like, all large organizations know that they, they're, not, they, they're not trying to blindly copy. They're really smart people. It's one of the big pieces of kind of arrogance and hubris about some parts of the community that they think that everybody who works for a large organization by definition doesn't get it. And that's just not true. Having worked with so many organizations now over the past couple of years, it's not that organizations don't get it. It's that it's very easy to say, think the way I think. And if you then don't give people any kind of explanation of how it is that you're thinking, well, how on earth are they supposed to be copying what you're or learning your way of thinking? It's a bit like you know, taking a kid and giving them some kind of vague advice. Well, just keep your body weight down the mountain and then throwing them out of a helicopter with some skis on and making sure they'll figure it out. That's not how we teach skiing. How should we teach anything else like this? So given that adopting something as big and momentous nowadays as DevOps is a non-trivial endeavor that touches many parts of your organization, what I'd like to do in this first part of this topic is to try to give some underlying idea of what that thinking framework is. So the big change that I think we've all lived through is not the let's make these joined up teams and have big, you know, I don't know, team meetings together and then we'll all understand each other better. The big real change that we've lived through in this past decade is that working in operations has gone from hauling blades to writing code, largely. I remember the days when basically if you were doing a lot of the stuff was physical stuff. You would go into the data center, you would cable up stuff, you would move racks around, you would arrange cooling, you would order stuff, pull it out of boxes. No, supply chain stuff. And that was tricky. It required a certain skill set. You had to have some dexterity, some ingenuity for how to do it the right way. But by and large, this is not the way most of operations spends its time nowadays. And that is a result of a very simple thing, virtualized data centers. Things that used to be physical, um, first of all servers, then storage, now networking, et cetera, et cetera, are now just pieces of code. And what does that mean? Well, it means that being in operations essentially means you are also a software developer, whether you like it or not. We've written scripts forever and ever, but now we're doing kind of quote unquote serious software development. I mean, there's an object model behind data centers. You make a virtual network interface and you attach it to a virtual network. So there's all these kind of classic software development concepts that suddenly become applicable to our work in operations, if you like. And it makes sense since you know, the development part of the house has spent years struggling with the problem of how to do development better to try to apply some of these methodologies to the development that we do in operations, whether that's continuous integration as a practice, whether that's having IDEs that allow you to you know, work with server definitions or whatever in a nicer way, whether that's doing build pipelines and so on and so forth. These are all development practices that we are slowly, slowly trying to apply to operations. And so if we're going to try and learn the lessons from development, if you like, and apply them to operations today, which lessons should we learn? Probably not waterfall, 
because we gave that up in development like a decade ago officially, and it's not great. Cowboy coding, well, it's still pretty popular in development, but probably also not the best thing to do if you need to manage stuff at scale. We are applying, here I come back to the, what I started out with, we are applying the lessons of agile development methodologies. And so that's coming full circle. DevOps started out as a concept of how do we do agile operations. If, that's, if, you, if you understand that to mean we are going to try to apply agile thinking and ideas to operations work, where operations work means software-defined data centers, then I think you have a good fundamental grasp of where a lot of these symptoms and practices and tools and so on are coming from. And so all the things that we always hear talked about, like regular communication, break things into smaller batches of work, don't try to do a million things at the same time, you know, have some kind of automated version strategy for testing the stuff that you're doing, that all explains itself very naturally if you think of DevOps as applying these kind of methodologies to operations work. So what happens when you do that? Now I need to start speaking faster because I'm running out of time. The natural immediate conclusion of this is that you end up with two development departments in your organization. One might be outsourced, but in general, if you look at the, the overall pie that you're delivering, there's going to be two development teams working on it. The app dev team, the dev dev team that delivers the, the business logic, if you like, and the application component, and the ops dev team that delivers a lot of the platform, infrastructure, runtime, whatever you want to call it, on which this stuff actually ends up running. This is a pretty easy model to adopt, initially anyway, because it, it reflects, you know, the dev dev part doesn't change, the ops dev part undergoes the same translation that I was just talking about, it becomes a development team. It respects existing organizational boundaries and structures and so on. Of course, these two teams somehow need to work together. So there needs to be some notion of a contract that links the two. Uh, because ultimately, you need to put the pie together to hand it over to your customers so that they can eat it and say how nice it is. And most of the time, this contract takes the shape of a kind of runtime platform. It's an interface, a technical interface, a package definition, whatever you're going to call it which is basically, you give me whatever application code and configuration you want, put it here, and we will make sure it runs. And we will take care of all the boring operational stuff, such as monitoring, logging, scaling, et cetera, et cetera, traffic distribution. Now, the, the big untold secret is a lot of very, very well-known, highly sophisticated example cases of DevOps work exactly in this way. And that's not a problem. This is not necessarily the wrong way to do it. There are plenty of examples of Netflix, good example, for instance. The one thing that is required about this approach, though, is that this platform better be really, really good and really powerful. Because developers are perfectly happy to give you their code and if you make sure it just works. But it better just work. Um, an interesting story about this. I spoke to one of the organizers of a, a very a DevOps days from a while ago, one of the first ones in Boston. And his company, so he was big about the DevOps and everybody together. His company had been acquired by Google. And so I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and I asked him, so what's it like at Google? How does DevOps work? Clearly you all talk to each other and you get these tours of how the runtime works and they tell you and you understand better and you can write better code. And he said, you know what? I have no idea how my code runs. And you know what? I don't even care. Of course, what he wasn't saying is that he didn't have to care because it really worked. And what he also wasn't saying is that this works at Google because at Google, you as a developer can't write arbitrary code. You write code the way Google wants you to write code. Otherwise, it just doesn't run. So there's clearly a trade-off to be made to that we need to be aware of. But this is perfectly legitimate. On the other hand, it may not be the right thing in every situation. Now, if the platform that you offer is very limited and basically half the applications that your organization writes couldn't work on it, um, if it's brittle, if it falls over all the time, then, of course, you're not going to make developers happy by giving them this kind of contract, which is useless because they can't make any use of it. So there is certainly a potential in quite a few situations for a 1 plus 1 equals 3 kind of opportunity. Can we move from DevOps with an uppercase O, if you like? This is why it's one of my first questions at the DevOps stage. How do we spell DevOps? Patrick Dubar voted for lowercase, and I'm, I'm leaning towards 
the conclusion that I'm not sure whether there is a, a right case. But so we, here we're talking DevOps with an uppercase O, two different teams both doing development. Here we're talking about DevOps with a lowercase O. One team, one integrated team. There's tremendous promise in this approach. It gives you more flexibility. It allows for shared learning. There's a lot of things that this can bring. Of course, there are also challenges that this can bring because it tends to disrupt organizations more. Now, the million dollar question, and I see that I've caught up with the time, so uh, I think we'll be all good here. Is there a right answer? I don't have enough time in this first session to try to go into what I think the right answer is, but from what I've said, I'm pretty sure most of you can kind of take a guess. That's pretty much what we're going to be discussing um, in the breakout session, plus talking about how you go about finding out which answer may be the right one for your teams and what that actually looks like in practice. I mean, so far it's been very theoretical, but okay, now I've figured out what I want to do. What does that look like? What tools do I need? What practices do I need? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let me briefly let that all sink in for a second and then try to summarize some of the key points that I've tried to make in, in these very short 20 minutes. I started out by asking, you know, do we, we're do all doing DevOps evidently and, and there's a lot of unclarity or, or vagueness in, in, in the world out there as to what DevOps actually means. Um, and we, especially if we're working in enterprise environments, if we haven't been coming to this field for five, six, ten, whatever years, we can all feel much better if we feel that we are making the right decisions based on a sound underlying framework of understanding rather than just copying bits and pieces of certain practices. The one thing that certainly has happened, whether you ignore DevOps or not, operations has become a software business. Virtual data centers means if you're an ops guy, you're right, or girl, you're writing code. Um, and it means that you know, all the methodologies, practices, and so on of development start to apply to you. One thing I didn't say when I was talking about these two teams, in a lot of DevOps organizations, one team is far more advanced than the other one. And that isn't necessarily the dev dev team. Now, there are plenty of organizations where the people doing development on the operation side have it down much better They've got their practices much more neat. They, they, they're much more effective. There's much less waste. There are fewer bugs. So there's, even though it's a quote unquote younger discipline, there's no saying that you know, one lags behind the other. But having two effectively development organizations in your setup is not a DevOps sin, in my view. Um, I think we need to move beyond that rather um, kind of dogmatic view uh, of what DevOps is. But creating end-to-end -end development teams does introduce a whole bunch of possibilities and also challenges. And as I've said, you know, figuring out which one is right for you, if you can do that, and if you can feel confident with the result, then you are thinking the way that masters think. And so with that, um, I was going to invite everybody to come to our booth for a bunch of swag because of course, it's nice to have a nice discussion and get a t-shirt for your family at the same time. But unfortunately, I've learned that the booths have all gone today. So if you do want something, you'll find me or one of my colleagues. They're running around. I'm sure we can get something to you or indeed continue the discussion. And I will be doing, quote, unquote, part two of this talk um, in the breakout session in Venezia. I think in a, I don't know, it's, it's on your programs. Um, I think it's the next session or the one after that. And with that, with some little time to go, I will say thank you very much.